right, well, good evening, everyone. We'll be starting momentarily. I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Just gonna wait for the uh, waiting room to empty out and we will get started in probably a good 30 seconds or so. Uh, while we wait, uh, for those who are already uh, in the program, uh, if you're comfortable doing so, no obligation, but if you're comfortable doing so, uh, feel free in the chat to let us know where you're joining us from tonight. So uh, certainly no obligation, but uh, if you're comfortable doing so, let, us, let Jay and I know where you're watching from tonight. It's always a nice icebreaker. I'm gonna give it another 10 seconds and then we'll get moving here. Uh, we are also streaming live on the Tewksbury Public Library's Facebook page. And we are here on Zoom with a pretty sizable audience, which is great to see. All right, see a lot of Tewksbury's, some Lowell's, Methuen, Hudson, Haverhill, Phoenix, Arizona via Tewksbury, Redding, Merrimack, New Hampshire, uh, next door in Wilmington, wonderful, wonderful, excellent. All right, well, wanna thank everyone for joining us. My name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, for those of us live here on Zoom, uh, you'll be receiving an email from me tomorrow morning with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please fill that out. Let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Uh, I am, uh, we are in Zoom webinar mode tonight, so neither Jay nor myself can see or hear the audience. Uh, just know we are recording this program uh, and we will make it available uh, to anyone who registered. I will include that in the email and uh, we will also uh, provide this to Tewksbury Telemedia who will, who will put it up on local access TV and uh, who will share it on the town's YouTube channel. Uh, to set expectations, I uh, anticipate this program lasting approximately an hour and uh, we will take questions at the end. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, please type it into the Q&A. Uh, and if you have a comment, type it into the comment. And I will relay all questions and comments to Jay at the end of the program. Uh, we are solo tonight. It's just, uh, we're just sponsored tonight by the Friends of the Tewksbury Library. So we wanna thank them for all their generosity. Before we get to the good stuff, I did wanna preview Thursday's program, which I think if you like tonight's program, I think you're gonna like Thursday night's program too. Uh, on Thursday night, uh, May, this Thursday, May 6th, 7, 7 o'clock via Zoom, uh, Joseph Bagley, who's the city archeologist of Boston, uh, will discuss his brand new book, just came out last week, uh, called Boston's Oldest Buildings and Where to Find Them. As Boston approaches its 400th anniversary, anniversary, it is remarkable that it still maintains its historic character despite constant development. Boston's Oldest Buildings and Where to Find Them is the first book to survey Boston's 50 oldest buildings, all of which predate 1800, and does so through an approachable narrative which will appeal to non-architects and those new to historic preservation. Each chapter features a different building, a narrative focusing on its historical significance and the efforts made to preserve it over time. Full color photos and historical draw drawings illustrate each building and area. Uh, the book and this talk will be perfect for history lovers, architectural enthusiasts and tourists alike. And as I mentioned, uh, Joseph Bagley is the city archeologist of Boston. He's a historic preservationist and he's a staff member of Boston Landmarks Commission. He has worked for multiple local and state historic preservation offices, uh, including uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission and the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And he is also the author of the book, A History of Boston and 50 Artifacts. So I am gonna put a link to Thursday's program on the 50 oldest buildings in Boston in the chat. And I will also include that link in the email I send everyone tomorrow morning. All right, I think I've set expectations. I think I've gone through the uh, minutia here. So I think we are good to go. Let me introduce tonight's guest speaker. Uh, so tonight's program is entitled More Hidden Treasures of Boston. We're gonna get an inside look at some of Boston's hidden treasures from popular Boston tour guide, Jay Bazinotti. And uh, Jay, um, among other things, is a volunteer with uh, Boston by Foot. 
uh, a corporal in the 1st New Hampshire Regiment of Revolutionary War Reenactors. Jay um, will appear in uh, somewhat full uniform to talk about some of the little known landmarks and, and monuments in the Boston area. I am told, Jay told me that his uh, suit is at the tailors at the moment. So he's gonna do, he's gonna make the best out of what he has. Uh, much of Boston's rich and fascinating history is invisible, not just to the casual visitor, but also to those who have lived here all their lives. And again, I wanna thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring tonight's event. So all uh, 50 of us or so watching here live on Zoom, another 10 or so on Facebook, and I'm sure the hundreds, Jay, that are gonna watch on YouTube. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jay for joining us here tonight. And Jay, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. I, I am very grateful uh, to the Tewksbury Library and yourself for inviting me to give this presentation. Again, my name is Jay Bazinotti. I uh, am a retired technologist. I've been doing amateur tour guides for about 30 years. And I love Boston very much. I've been all over the world. Um, to uh, 23 countries and 46 U.S. states. And Boston is still the best place in the world as far as I'm concerned. And uh, over the years, I have found many incredible things, things that I think are incredible, and I'd like to share them with you. Um, as Robert said, I am also a corporal in the 1st New Hampshire Regiment. The 1st New Hampshire Regiment is out of uh, Nashville, New Hampshire. We are a reenactor group. It was the very first unit to be inducted into the United States Army. And that happened in Medford, Massachusetts. And it was the last unit to be mustered out of the United States Army in 1789 by George Washington himself on Boston Common. So we do all kinds of reenactments around New England, in Canada, in Europe. And um, I've been doing that for about 40 years. So in any event, the name of this presentation uh, is uh, Boston Things That Are Free, Cheap, Dear, and Hidden. It's a seven part, present, uh, seven part series, and this is part two. Uh, I did uh, part one, I think in January, and I hope you'll join me for this. Uh, I love doing this stuff and um, I hope it shows. So naturally, Robert, the presentation doesn't work and it always fails. <laughs> Well, we're here, Jay. So uh, you can't advance the you cannot advance the screen. Yeah, this. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's not working. There you oh, go. I was, so I was scared there for a minute. It always fails the first time. You got it, okay. Jay. So the presentation is broken into two parts. The first part I always do is cool things from Boston, and these are things that um, are from around Boston, things that have affected the world or that are interesting, that came from Boston themselves. And the very first one I have here is the fork. The fork is a relatively a new invention. Um, although it did show up around 450 AD, it did not catch on in Europe until 1611. And for a long time, um, that was because um, the Catholic Church believed that using a fork was blasphemy because God gave us fingers. However, um, the fork did be start to become more popular thanks to a tourist, one of the world's first tourists, Thomas Coriat, that you can see there on the screen, and he went around Europe and he wrote about things. And um, one of the things he wrote about was the fork. So what happened was, is while people really weren't even using forks in Europe, our buddy, Governor John Winthrop, introduced the fork to America in 1630. What's really interesting about this fork is it only had two times, right? And so I've used this type of fork many times as a reenactor. And I will tell you that it is terrible. It's very hard to use. Most people only owned a spoon. And of course, everybody had a jackknife or some kind of a knife, but usually the spoon was the thing you ate with. Um, people started making forks out of twisting wire together. And uh, I actually have tried using the twisted wire forks as well, and they're terrible. Thank God that the modern four time fork came in the 1800s. But uh, again, introduced to America by John Winthrop in 1630 with the uh, same time that Boston was created. The first paper currency in the U.S. was made here. This little picture of a bill is an original picture of a bill that actually was counterfeit, that somebody tried to change the number. So they tried to make uh, two shillings worth 20 shillings. And two, uh, a shilling back in those days was roughly equal to about, um, well, it says $200 there. But a century later, a shilling was worth about $10, which goes to show you how the value of money changed. So um, nowadays, um, 
money is made, Amer all American money, paper for the money, is made of crane paper in Dalton, Massachusetts. And it's the only place that makes money. They use a secret recipe that it's, when the paper is made, it goes to Washington where they make it into dollar bills. Uh, Paul Revere was the first person to make, make the money. And uh, we also make the money for Sweden. Um, what's happening now with money is they're actually going to have, instead of just a hologram, they're going to have true motion to try and stop counterfeiters. Um, counterfeiting has been a problem, as you can see, since the very first time that money was introduced in, in Boston. This is one of the coolest things, the steel shovel. So um, one of the first companies that uh, was put into Faneuil Hall was the Ames Plow Company, which you can still see the sign there. And it was, it was made into a restaurant. But John Ames invented the iron shovel in West, West Bridgewater. And until then, people used wooden planks on a, on a, on a um, pole as shovels. And I've used those as well. And they are terrible. But Captain Ames invented these shovels. And by 1900, 80% of all the shovels in the world were Ames shovels. The Ames family were called the King of Spades because of all the shovels that they made. He made all the pack shovels for the Union Army during the Civil War. And he also supplied the shovels for the Transcontinental Railroad, which his family also controlled and financed. Oliver and Oak Ames during the Civil War were major movers and shakers of the Transcontinental Railroad. So there's not much left of the Ames plant left in Northeast, and it's actually a uh, condo. As you can see the little picture of what, look, what the factory looks like. But the Ames mansion, they actually privately owned until the 1980s when it was sold to Emerson University. And about five years ago, they sold it to a, a rich Saudi Arabian dude who just broke it up into like uh, 12 condominiums. It is amazingly beautiful inside. If you ever get the chance to see the pictures of it, you would be amazed. I used to walk by it all the time and say, how could one family own almost an entire city block in Boston on Commonwealth Avenue? But it is a, it's a beautiful house. And Ames was quite the guy, the king of spades. So the United States Army was formed in, uh, in Boston, actually in Medford, Massachusetts, as I said before. And the first leader of the 1st New Hampshire Regiment, which was the first unit in the Army, was John Stark. He was the guy who said, live free or die, which is on license plates in New Hampshire now. Stark was actually the savior of the Battle of Bunker Hill. If he had had his way, if he had been in charge, we probably would have won the battle and the war would have been over before it started. He was the one who put a cannon up there. He was the one who built the redoubts that stopped the British. And uh, there's a lot of controversy about the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, if you climb the monument on Bunker Hill now, his cannon is actually embedded into the wall at the top. It's 289 steps to the top of the tower. And you can see his cannon at the top embedded into the wall. So um, that's the United States Army formed in Medford. Um, the US Coast Guard, which started as a life-saving service, was also started here. The headquarters is uh, right on Atlantic Avenue near the Northern Avenue Bridge. And uh, John Foster Williams is the John Foster Williams building. Um, he commanded the USS Massachusetts, which was a life-saving ship back in then, and um, became the US Coast Guard instead of the life-saving service in 1915. This pictured ship is the Spencer, which is one of the two major ships that are uh, serving Boston. The other is the Escanada. They also have a fleet of many smaller ships. And it's interesting that the Coast Guard base is the only place in Boston where the harbor walk is broken up, where you can't walk along the harbor for security reasons. Since 9-11, that's been closed. Otherwise, you can walk a line 47 miles, I think it is, all the way around the harbor through East Boston. And the only place it breaks is at the Coast Guard base. The United States Navy was also invented here in Marblehead. Many people claim to have invented the United States Navy, but we'll say it's in Marblehead. And um, this was an act by Washington to start the Navy. And naturally, the Jewel, there's actually two jewels, I think, of the Navy. And the first one is the Constitution, which if I have guests come to Boston, is one of the places I always recommend they go. It makes my little heart go pitter patter that the Constitution is here in Boston. It is uh, quite an incredible thing. Um, it was one of the first three ships in the United States Navy. It is the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world, but not the oldest commissioned warship. The HMS Victory is actually uh, I think one year older 
than the Constitution, but that ship is in permanent dry dock. It never goes in the water. So the Constitution actually sails around the harbor a couple of times a year, especially on the 4th of July. And I have shot guns at it many times from Castle Island, and then it shoots back at us. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And the United States Navy is awesome. The other thing I wanted to tell you about is in Marblehead, and I talk about this in another presentation, is there is the painting um, by Willard of the three um, Revolutionary War soldiers marching. And we'll see that later. And I think that's one of the two jewels from uh, the Navy. The pencil. Yes, the first modern pencil was invented in 1795 by France, but the first modern pencil in America came from John Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau's father in Concord, Massachusetts around 1800. And um, we added that Charles Goodyear invented the vulcanized rubber in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1839, and that became the rubber eraser. And one of the interesting things about this is if you go to Concord, you can see Thoreau's gravesite and the people still leave pencils on his gravesite as a memorial to him. Yes, the banking swindle, 1809. This was an amazing story. Andrew Dexter was a man who wanted to do great things. He was probably the Bernie Madoff of his time. And what he did was this building that you see here was right next to what is the currently the old state house in Boston on State Street. And um, this building was one of the biggest buildings that he built in America at the time. It was, look, you can count it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine stories to the top. And this is a time 100 years before elevators, well, probably more like 50 years before elevators were invented. And this thing was massive. And he made it as a stock exchange building. And he built it with $50 because what he did was he bought up all these banks outside of Massachusetts. And in those days, banks made their own paper money saying that they had the gold to back it, but he didn't. But then what would happen is he would bring the money from Rhode Island and as far away as Michigan to Boston. And it was honored as real money, but for 90 cents on the dollar until word started to get out that the money was worthless. And then the officials went to these banks and they opened up all the safes and they found out that he only had $50 but he had spent $800,000 to build this building, thinking that he would get it all back. He never did, nobody wanted it because the outhouses only went to the fourth floor inside. So if you were on the ninth floor and you had to use the bathroom, you had to run down five stories. And in addition, all those floors had to have fires to be heated. So they had to be, people had to be running up and down stairs with wood all day and all night to keep the fires going. The tea exchange finally burned to the ground as a result of one of those fires that people were attending in 1819 and left a big hole in the ground. Only one person was killed. It was a boy who went exploring the rubble and fell into a vat of boiling beer that was in the basement. Um, he, Dexter, ran away to Nova Scotia when all this collapsed and made his way to Alabama where he inherited some land and he founded Montgomery and there he is considered a hero. Later, our pal Charles Bonzi right here in Boston started the Ponzi scheme. So it seems to me like we have a lot to answer for when it comes to banking swindles. The first police force in the United States, 1838. If you go to Boston, you can see the Boston police wear a patch on their shoulder. It says AD 1630. That reflects the uh, creation of Boston, not the police. The police were, uh, came in 1838. They, until then they were considered a night watch and uh, there were lamp lighters who had to go around and light all the lamps every night and put them out in the morning. They act as unofficial watchmen. Uh, people were uh, drafted into the watch. Everybody had to serve a number of days a month on the watch. Uh, but then in 1838, based upon the Peelian principles made by Sir Robert Peel in England, they hired six constables. And the money was um, considered very good for that time, $70 a day. Um, but, you know, being a cop was a good job. And uh, there was a lot of um, griping from the citizens about how well paid these six guys were. They didn't have guns. They had a little rattle like you see there in the picture. And what they would do is if they saw a crime, they would rattle at and the rattle would make people come and help them. They also had a big shepherd's staff with a hook on the end. And if somebody was running away, they would grab them with them and pull them back. Pretty amazing how things have changed. Um, in 1851, the first Irish policeman was hired in Boston, the first Irish policeman in America, by name Skinnigan. 
He was hired and fired three times because of the anti-Irish sentiment that was going through the city at the time. And uh, finally, he was able to keep his job. We also hired the first black policeman, Horatio Homer. He served for 40 years and retired as a sergeant around the time of the First World War. He was considered the unofficial mayor of Boston. He gave all the tours to, uh, to uh, visiting dignitaries. And he was a, uh, today he would be a scientist. He was a polymath. He spoke six languages. He, he played four or five different instruments. He, he was quite, quite the guy that uh, Horatio Homer, and he's buried in Boston too. Morse code was invented here. Um, the building where a lot of inventions were made was what we call now the corner bookstore across from the South Street Church. That building has so much history in it that I'm sure it's going to be in the book that Bagley talks about on Thursday. But one of the things that happened there was Samuel Morse invented the Morse code. Now, people credit him with inventing um, telegraph, telegraphy, but he didn't. It was a man named Wheatley in England who invented telegraphy, but his system was terrible and it didn't work very well. Um, Samuel Morse took that system and improved it. And what he really did was market his Morse code, which was the best and fastest way for sending messages. And that took off around the world and was adopted as the mechanism for doing telegraphy, which made Mr. Wheatley very, very unhappy. Um, but, you know, Morse gets the credit, Wheatley gets forgotten. Ether as a painkiller. This was a pretty amazing thing. At Mass General Hospital, it was performed by a dentist on a guy with a neck tumor. And many people thought it was a gimmick, including Dr. Warren, who was the chief medical scientist at the first medical chief at Harvard University. And he had been conned into some pain relieving scheme about a month earlier. So he thought that it was baloney. So Dr. Morton, the dentist, performed this operation where he removed this tumor and Warren looked on. And when the patient woke up, he said that he felt no pain. And Dr. Warren muttered the famous words, gentlemen, this is no humbug. Even he was convinced that ether was real. So, but ether had been around for a long time. People use it as a party gag. You know, they would go and they'd suck on the ether and then it'd get all drunk and everything. And they thought it was fun, um, but it had been around for many years. So no one got the credit. So a giant ether statue was put in uh, the public garden where no name was engraved on it because they didn't want to give credit to any one man when so many people were involved in ether. But the first time that it was used was at the Mass General Hospital. And this painting is in the Ether Dome, which I think I talk about later in this presentation. And it's a great place to visit. Still in use as a um, lecture hall, no longer a surgical theater. First commuter rail in America from Boston to Dedham, right? So um, people were starting to get tired of Boston back in those days. After the Civil War, Boston was very, very crowded. There was uh, a lot of horse manure. And there was a lot of traffic. Uh, horse traffic. There were no rules of the road. The rules of the road came about in uh, the, eight, the late 1800s. They were made in New York by a guy whose name I forget right now. Um, actually, he was a great guy, but he's the one that uh, put the lines on the street and invented the stop signs and whatnot, but they didn't have any of that then. So people wanted to live outside the city. So there was a rail line that went to Dedham that uh, is pretty famous for something else later the Bussey Street Bridge disaster, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. So what happened was, is um, this gentleman was the lowest bidder to build a bridge and they gave him the contract and he had never built a bridge before. And it was a particularly complicated bridge. So when he was done, the commuter trains went back and forth to Boston and the Bussey Street Bridge one day just collapsed and it was a huge disaster. Um, we will talk about that again later. Forest Hills was one of the biggest train stations in America by 1909. It's not much to look at now. Um, I used to go there when I was younger and it was really pretty terrible. Uh, since then, it's been uh, heavily revamped. It's a little bit more attractive. But um, at one time, it was quite the thing, which also brings up that South Station in Boston was the biggest train station in the world, in the entire world, at the turn of the century. The Boston Terrier was first bred here in the United States cross between a bulldog and a terrier. He was one of the most popular breeds in the world. And this guy named Robert Hopper did it. And what he tried to do was he wanted to eliminate the aggressive tendencies of a, a bulldog. So he bred this thing. And it's actually one of the most popular 
of breeds of dogs. Basketball was invented here. You know that we have the Basketball Museum and the Hall of Fame in Springfield. It was invented at the YMCA. And of course, the first YMCA was also in Boston. And the first YMCA in America was also in Boston. Um, it was made by this guy, Dr. James Desmond, as a way to give students something to do inside on rainy days. But by 18, this is 1998, I apologize for the typo, 1898, it had just spread across the nation. But the YMCA, which was very conservative, they didn't want to support it because they thought it was too rough. But by 1920, it had, it had taken over the, uh, the nation. And now you can see where, it, where it's gone today. The first subway in America, still there, Park Street Station um, at the Common in Boston. This was a cut and cover uh, method of digging a tunnel and then covering it over. Uh, Boston was a mess. There was no way to get through Tremont Street uh, without any kind of injury. It was so crowded. So the subway was built and it was uh, electrified. This guy named Frank Sprague revolutionized the trolley. He made the constant motion engine. And that's why around Boston, you can see a lot of things are named Sprague. After this guy, he started Sprague Electric, which was a famous company that made electric components for many, many years. Uh, people loved the subway. They were really afraid of it at first. They thought that they were going into hell. Uh, the churches railed against it. They said going down into the subway would make you sick because of all the bad air and all this other stuff. But eventually people got on and they, and they loved it. And one of the things that is really cool is one of the oldest things in Boston was discovered were the fish weirs. When they started digging up Tremont Street, what they came across was a bunch of sticks that were buried in the dirt. And it turns out that uh, 5,000 years ago, Boston was covered by water and the Indians would put these sticks in the ground. And when the tide came in, the fish would come in. And when the tide went out, the fish would be stuck in the weirs and they just had to wade out and catch the fish. They didn't have to do any work at all. So um, that was a, a very cool thing. We still find stuff like that when we dig in Boston all the time. For example, Beacon Street is a dam. And if you dig under Beacon Street, um, you'll still get in, you'll still find the dam that's holding up that part of the city. First dedicated police car was the Stanley Steamer. The first police vehicle was a paddy wagon and that's what they called it. We don't use that term anymore, but that was what they called it in Akron, Ohio. Ohio. But it was eventually destroyed by the drunks who it was supposed to pick up. They pushed it into the river. Um, but the first dedicated police car in America was this 1903 Stanley Steamer. We had to have a chauffeur because no, nobody knew how to drive it. Uh, driving a steam car was actually a very complicated thing to do in those days. If you've ever seen a Stanley Steamer or see how it works today, you'll see that it's a really complicated thing. Cars in those days were tough. However, motorcycles, which were invented in Boston, were the preferred vehicle for chasing down bicyclists. Uh, because they were faster than bicyclists and they could get through the crowded roads. Uh, the first police wagon came to Boston in 1912. This is a really incredible story. It's one of my favorite stories. The first purpose-built fire engine was built here in Boston. The history of fire engines is really pretty amazing. The first fire engine in America was built here in Boston sometime in the 1700s. And in fact, you can still see it at the Boston Fire Museum. But this was the first purpose-built engine. A guy named Newsom invented the steam engine in uh, the 1800s. And when he invented its steam engine for putting out fires, the firemen in London saw it. The first fire was the London Opera House fire. And when they saw what it could do, they were so scared for their jobs that they destroyed the fire engine. And so John Newsom was discouraged. So he came to New York and he sold his fire engine to New York. And the firemen used it. And when they saw what it could do, they were so worried about their jobs that they destroyed the fire engine. So he decided to sell one to Boston. And when the firemen in Boston saw what it could do, they destroyed the fire engine. So he thought the only way to get beyond this was to sell a fleet of them. So he sold a fleet of them to Cleveland, Ohio. And when the firemen saw what the engine could do, they pushed them all in the river. But they were all afraid for losing their jobs. They were Luddites. And you know the Luddites were the guys who threw their um, shoes, which were called sabots into the gears of the textile mill to destroy them, which is where we get the word sabotage. And this sort of thing happens a lot throughout history of technology being destroyed. The last horse-drawn fire engines in a major city were in 1922 in New York, and the last one in Boston was in 1938. And it, as it turns out, my aunt actually used to house the horses 
for the fire engines on the outskirts of Boston until the 19, late 1930s. And the important thing about this was fire engines were really expensive so that when gasoline engines started to come out for fire engines, they weren't gonna get rid of their horse-drawn steam engines. And what they first did was they attached a motor um, tractor to, this, to the, uh, the fire engine part. And then eventually they put them all together. And that was what happened here um, on the outskirts of Boston with the first integrated fire engine. One of my favorite stories. The first fighter aircraft in America was made here in Boston in 1915. It was built by Sturdivant in Hyde Park. Sturdivant came to Boston for Maine with 60 cents in his pocket, invented a new way to make shoes. He invented the um, uh, ventilator for factories to suck dust out of the air and made a fortune. So after he made all this money, he decided to build an aircraft for the military. In those days, they weren't called fighters, they were called battle planes. And so he built four of this plane, it was a terrible plane. The pilots couldn't see over the dashboard. They almost always crashed. And when the, when the army came to um, review the plane, it almost crashed onto the Reedville racetrack, which we talk about later. And the uh, army took a pass on it. So uh, Sturdivant failed at making airplanes. He went on to be a contractor to Curtis and Boeing. And this plane is in the Smithsonian Institution now. And here, this is really important. The first liquid-fueled rocket, 1926, Robert Goddard. Everybody thought he was a nutbag. He went out there, invented all these rockets. He had 214 patents, and most of the rockets we use today still are using his technology in some way or another. So finally, he went to New Mexico and did his stuff. Um, modern fuel rockets use kerosene as the main fuel. What's really interesting is during World War II, when the Germans were making the V-2 and the V-1 rockets after the war was over, they asked them with the technology, how they learned the technology. And they looked at the allies, Robert Goddard, and he said, we learned it all from Goddard. They couldn't believe it. So um, that was another cool thing that came from Boston. The first microwave oven, oh, what an incredible piece of technology. And the guy who invented it, this Percy, he got a $2 bonus for inventing the microwave oven. Uh, when it first came out, it was a massive device, very expensive, only was supposed to be used by restaurants, but the restaurants hated it. The chefs hated it. They refused to use it. So they, so Raytheon made a company called Amana to make um, consumer microwaves. And by 1975, they were taking over the world. For a successful organ transplant, it was a, it was a um, well, the first transplant, People have been trying to transplant things since cavemen days. We can find skulls where people have had holes drilled in their head through panning. So, um, but people were trying to do all kinds of things since 1679, as you can see. And then there was corneal transplant in 1906. Um, but this guy, Dr. Murray, transplanted a kidney in 1954 from one twin to another, and both patients survived the long term. This happened at the Peter Brent Brigham Hospital. And this paved the way for all manner of transplants that, that we now take for common, you know, we take uh, for granted today. All for Boston. And uh, all kinds of cars. Boston was a car making capital. The first cars in America were made by the Doria brothers in 1893. They were called smoke wagons. They were terrible vehicles, but you know, we got better and better. The Europeans were about 15 years ahead of us because you know, auto invented the, uh, the gasoline engine. We still call it the auto engine today. Um, the Stanley Steamer was made in, 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 uh, in Newton and in Portsmouth, um, New Hampshire, was the fastest car in the world, 124 miles an hour. One of the reasons why Henry Ford invented the Indianapolis 500 was to put the Stanley Steamer out of business because only gas cars could run on the uh, Daytona 500 and the Indianapolis 500. Uh, the only place that Rolls Royce was made out of England was made in Springfield, the Silver, the Silver Ghost. They made them for 20 years. And if you go down the Mass Pike as you're heading to Boston, you can still see the Model T Ford, Model T Ford plant right on the left-hand side by the, uh, where the uh, old toll booths used to be in Alston Brighton, still there. And um, they made many cars. They made more cars there until the 40s than Detroit did. And um, the first global auto trip started here in Boston by a man named Glidden. He was a partner of uh, Alexander Graham Bell. And he and his wife went to 46 countries by car, starting in Boston. And he also was the guy that started uh, 
licenses for pilots. The first license went to uh, Curtis. Uh, Wilver and Oval Wright only got five and six. So as a, as a trivial aside, the first transcontinental car trip took place from San Francisco to New York by a man named Horatio Jackson and his dog. It took 39 days in 1903. Um, it was a miserable trip. There were no roads. Later, about 10 years later, a, a young lieutenant named Dwight Eisenhower commandeered a convoy of military trucks, which also took more than 39 days. He had to build 88 bridges and 15 soldiers died in the attempt to cross the country in the, in the mid-teens. That is the end of cool things from Boston part of the presentation. And now we'll talk about hidden things in Boston. And um, the first thing that I like to talk about, this is one of my favorite things that I always bring people to see, is the Tiffany Glass collection at the Arlington Street Church. One of the things I like about this is that it is free. Um, the church was built in 1861. It was always a leader in thought and still is today. It was the first building built on the filled in back bay. You know, Boston, most a lot of Boston back bay was filled in by the firm of Munson and Goss. They don't even have a statue, which I think is a travesty. The uh, Arlington Street Church also had the first gay marriage in 2004. And they have the largest collection of Tiffany glass in the world. This was put in by Lewis Comfort Tiffany between 1900 and 1930. They never were able to finish the job. Tiffany went out of business before the last two windows were complete, completed. There are five, he invented five different kind, types of glass, which he interleaved together to make a 3D scene. And when you go into this building and the, and the sun hits the glass, it is so ineffable that I, I, I really can't recommend enough that you go to check this out. It really is quite beautiful to see. Then around 1970, during the height of the anti-war protests in Vietnam, some right-wing protesters started throwing cinder blocks through the windows because they didn't like the church's views against the Vietnam War. So the church was forced to cover all the windows with armor. And they only took the armor down um, within the last few years. So the windows have been invisible and covered since 1970. So now when you go in there, you can see this beautiful uh, effect of the sun hitting the glass. Um, the church has recently been completely refurbished. It's quite a thing to see. There's also another big collection of Tiffany glass at the Church of the Covenant in the back bay, which is also worth going to see. The very first football game in America played right here in Boston. This is a monument to the Oneida football team, the greatest football team of all time never lost a game, won every championship, and is still on the rosters as a professional football team today because they've been paying their dues since they were discovered. It was called the Oneida team because the captain, Gat Miller, grew up in Oneida, and that's what he named the team. They only played for three years, but they played right there on the Boston Common. It was the very first place that a football game was played. Boston uh, football was a lot different in those days. The ball was round. The field was different. There were a lot of rules and people died playing the game. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, when he was president, threatened to make football illegal if they didn't clean up their act because people were dying while playing. This, I think, is one of the top attractions for me whenever I give a tour is the Parkman Bandstand. This was put in by uh, George Parkman Jr. to honor his father. Um, his father was one of the richest men in Boston and he was killed in a crime that was pinned on a unpopular Harvard chemistry professor named John Webster, who was hung for the crime, but he claimed he was innocent. And what had happened was his accuser was his janitor, a man named Littlefield, who found the bones of George Parkman that had been burned in acid and thrown into a fire and the, pointed the finger at Webster and he became rich and famous as a result of doing this, it's called a reward. It was the trial of the century. People came from all over the country, all over the world to watch the, uh, the trial. And later on, John Webster was hung at the hanging tree, which was near the frog pond, is now a little marker that tells you where that elm tree was. Uh, fell down, I think, in 1880. Um, but he donated all the money for the trees in the name of his father, and they built the Parkman Bandstand for it. The interesting thing about this is that in 1954, a Boston prosecutor opened up the case and he believes that it was Littlefield who killed 
Parkman and pinned it on Webster. So there's still a lot of controversy around who really did it. When I read the story and I look at all the evidence and whatnot, it seems to me that it was Webster, but there's no doubt that it could have been Littlefield. This building is hilarious. This is the last building of the West End of Boston. In the, up until 1958, the West End was a huge area, huge neighborhood of Boston, much like the North End, um, that was hated by government because of all the immigrants that lived there. Mr. Spock uh, grew up there. Um, this is uh, 42 Lomazny Way, and you can, you can drive by it. And all the buildings were torn down and the people were kicked out. And they were told that when they built the new buildings, they would be allowed to come back. But of course, they were not allowed to come back. Uh, 50 people lived in, the, in this building. We don't know why this building was saved for real, except that the guy who lived there was the uncle of one of the patriarchers who was a big Boston mobster, and he didn't want to move. So some people believe that the reason why the building survived was because a mobster lived there. Um, some people also say that some of this building was the model for the house in the movie Up that goes up in the sky with the balloons, the, the cartoon. So I, I like to drive by there and point this building out to people. This is one of my all time favorite locations, the old Schwann Mill in Arlington. It is the oldest factory in America. It's one of the oldest continuously operating factories in the entire world. And what they do is they make the oval frames that the pictures of the presidents of the United States are put in when they're hung in the Capitol in Washington, DC. And they have been making all kinds of wooden products, six to 1600s. They were still running on a water powered mill and a steam mill until the 1980s. Uh, when the building closed down, they were gonna tear it down and put a parking lot there. But a uh, woman, a female benefactor came in and bought the whole thing for a song. It still had all the original tools. When you take the tour, it's all run by the overhead belts. And the carpenter who is there making the frame on a very special elliptical um, spinning device lathe, they actually let you give it a whirl. So it's it really is the coolest tour. And you go in there and you can see they have all the old patents and all the workers have written on the walls with pencil. And uh, it, it is an amazing thing. It's hidden. It's very hard to find in Arlington. <clears throat> and, and it's one of my all time favorite venues for, for going to visit. Here we have the Blue Hills Climbing Park in Boston. This used to be the quarries, the, the, the granite quarries of, of, uh, of uh, Quincy. And this quarry was opened up to quarry the granite for the Bunker Hill Monument. And it was in operation until 1965. And when it, it um, closed, it was just a big pit in the ground that filled up with water. It was about 230 feet of water. And people used to party there and they would uh, get drunk and a lot of people drowned and gangsters would put their quarry in the trunks of stolen cars and push it in the water. And after a while, when they were doing the big dig, they decided to fill it in. So they filled it in and now it is a rock climbing park. This is one of the most surreal places you will ever see. This is one picture of many from the top where that guy with the red hat is, you can see the entire skyline of Boston. And that's not even the highest venue. You can get in your car and drive up to the Granite Links. It's a golf course at the very top that was made on an old dump. And uh, you can play golf or you can sit in the lounge and look out at Boston. It is the best view of the city from there. I, I can't recommend this enough. Go there and take a look at this rock climbing park. They actually have tours of it sometimes. They show you how they quarried the rock and then you go up and have a nice drink on the golf course. This was the painting I was talking about before. That's in Marblehead by Archibald Willard. He actually started painting this as a gag. The man in the middle is his father who actually fought in the Revolutionary War. And um, he painted this painting and when he started showing it around, it took off and became very famous. And so he made like 12 copies of it. One of them is in Washington, DC. This is the original one, which is in Marblehead. It is a massive painting. There is a, it, it is in the uh, executive hall of the town hall in Marblehead. I made a special trip out there just to go see this thing. And it is really quite an awesome thing. It makes your heart go pitter patter if you like that sort of thing. It is um, really an incredible part of our history. And along with the USS Constitution, I think it is one of the greatest things in Boston. 
Here is something that you will never get to see. I have never seen it. I've only heard about it. This is the Ted Williams Tunnel driving range. So when the Ted Williams Tunnel was made under the um, seaport, it was made with an enormous cave where they were going to store all kinds of vehicles. However, because of a mistake that was made in the construction, there's no way to get the vehicles inside. So there's no garage door, there's no big doors to get the vehicles inside. So all that's in there are little golf carts that drive in a service tunnel back and forth to the airport. But inside the cabin is so large that the state police can go down because it's underneath their headquarters and they could drive balls into a net, which is far down into the tunnel. So this is um, a pretty amazing thing. And nobody's ever allowed to go down there because they're afraid of terrorists going down there and blowing up the tunnel. This is gone. Now this was in Park Square, the Lincoln Freeze to Slave. It was a statue that was donated by Moses Kimball. Moses Kimball was a barker, a carnival barker like P.T. Barnum. He was a very good friend of P.T. Barnum and he was a very patriotic man. And he paid for this statue, which is a copy of a statue in Washington, D.C. And it sat in Park Square. Park Square back in those days was a rail hub. Now what's there is the Park Street uh, Hotel and the, there's this great big building on the other side in Bay Village. It was completely surrounded by tall buildings. So it was lost as the neighborhood changed. But in the past year, all the BLM movement uh, raised some issues and they have taken the statue away. I actually don't know where it is anymore. But whenever I went to Boston, I paid a, paid a special tribute to the statue because it really was large and it really was quite an amazing thing. And I hope that they put it in a museum and it's not lost forever. Lots of things do get lost forever in Boston, by the way, like uh, Alexander Graham Bell's laboratory disappeared. Here's the Ether Dome that I was telling you about. And you can see the painting that I used in the earliest photo there in the center. Now, this is exactly as it looked back in those days. It is now a lecture hall. And uh, right there in the center was where they did the, the operation. Um, it was a, a little tumor was removed, as we said before. And the fact that there was no pain ushered in the time of painless surgery, which were the four big bugaboos of medicine back in those days, which were controlling pain, controlling bleeding, controlling infection, and pharmacology. So those were the four big pillars of medicine that they were trying to achieve. And the first of those was the control of pain. So Dr. Warren, the guy who said this is no humbug, what he used to do was he used to collect all the medical oddities and dead things that he would work on back in those days, such as this dead Siamese twin uh, children. And he made a little museum, which is also in the uh, uh, also in the Mass General, not far from the Ether Dome. You can walk from one to the other. I have gone there a couple of times. I have to say it's probably not worth the visit, but there are some pretty amazing and gruesome things to see if you like that sort of thing. Not really that many. That's why it's it's a lot of work to get there. But if you really are interested in that kind of medical oddity, then that's the place to go see them. And here is again, more detail about the Bussy Street, Bussy Street Bridge disaster. This is like at the corner of Roslindale and Dedham. And um, I used to go by it all the time as a child and never knew that that bridge was the scene of this big disaster. There was a new bridge there that they made after the old one collapsed and is still used every day by commuter trains. And the guy who built this was really an incompetent who had no idea what he was doing. 158 people were killed. This was national news when it, when it happened. It went across the whole country. Um, the word death trap, by the way, was invented to talk about trains because before the invention of the Westinghouse air brakes, trains used to crash all the time. 50,000 people were killed or wounded in train crashes every year in America. When you think about it now, we have hundreds of millions of cars and only about 30,000 people, only, only about 30,000 people die in car crashes now. But back in those days, trains crashed all the time. The only car that had brakes was the engine. So it, it was, getting on a train was an adventure back in those days. There's a little tiny plaque that you can look for to find this uh, Bussy Street bridge disaster. A bunch of people tried to put a train in the Arnold Arboretum, which is right next door, to memorialize it, but they were not successful. The John Hancock Lantern, you can see from everywhere, you can know that this light tells you a story. The, went, the Lantern was added in 1950 and it flashes a little poem. And the poem is, if the light is flashing steady blue, the weather is clear view. If it's flashing blue, 
then clouds are due. If it's steady red, storms ahead. Flashing red, snow instead. And if it's flashing red in the summer, it means a Red Sox game has been rain, rained out. So in 2004, when the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time in 100 years or so, the um, red and blue sequence was added. So when the Red Sox win the World Series, which they've done a number of times now, they've changed the light pattern. And I just absolutely love this. This is one of the things that makes Boston such a cool city. Here's the Boston Fire Museum. Boston Fire Museum is a tiny building. It's an old fire station and it's located in South Boston on Conner Street. And I think it's free to go in or maybe $5. It's not, it's not um, expensive. Boston is the most burned down city in the history of the world. Um, in the 1980s, there was an Austin ring that was being run by the state police fire inspector, a man named La Furia. And um, he would take money and they would burn down buildings for you so you could get the insurance. It turned out when they broke the ring and the ring was broken by William Weld, who later became the governor. When this was Austin ring was broken, they started hundreds and hundreds of fires. And it turned out that there were all kinds of politicians, lawyers, landlords, people who were all involved in this ring and firebugs and unhappy firemen who were fired because of Proposition Two and a Half. And they were all caught by WNAC Channel 7 by a news camera who caught three guys pointing a gun at the uh, Garrity Lumber Fire in Reedville. And when they recognized who those guys were, they broke them and they broke the ring. The interesting thing about this was this is not the first fire museum there was a bigger and better fire museum and the firebugs burned it down too. So they burned all the artifacts from all those fires in Boston, which is terrible. But we do have the first fire engine in Boston, a copper pump wagon, which is going there. And what they do with it now is they use it to cool beer. The Gibson House Museum on Beacon Street is really one of my favorite places to go in Boston. But then again, everything in Boston is my favorite place. And this is what everybody always tells me. Jay, Every place is your favorite place. Well, I can't help it. Uh, I get so excited about everything that I see here. This is the only complete Victorian house in North America. So this is was built on filled land. It was one of the first buildings built on, built on filled land by Catherine Gibson. Her son moved in there. He never married or had kids. The house has all the original furniture, all the original bathroom, the original kitchen, the original coal cellar. And all this wallpaper that you're looking at the picture here is all made out of hand-tooled leather. So you can actually rent this place for your wedding or reception. There are limited tours on Tuesdays and Thursdays, of course, when there's no COVID. And you can go there and, and just see this amazing Victorian building exactly how it was back in those days, which I think is astonishing. Edgar Allan Poe, you know, was born here. And uh, he was born right across from the Boston Common, where it meets on Charles Street with the public gardens. As it turns out, Edgar Allan Poe hated Boston, hated, 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 moved away. Um, he served as a soldier at the um, Castle Island Fort, where he got the idea for the story, the last cask of uh, Montiato, where the, the man is built into the brick wall because a British soldier was actually found built into the wall. And he also served as a custom inspector at the Customs House in Boston as well. Um, it's next to the Colonial Theater, which is the oldest surviving theater in America. And they've recently put a big statue of a raven with Edgar Allan Poe right there across from L.J. Peretti's, which is the oldest tobacconist in America as well. The Boston Stone, this is a cool hidden thing that is hard to find. It's on Blackstone Street. Everybody has a different story about it. This is an amazing thing. Um, it was put there in 1737. No one knows to this day why it was there. And what they used to think it was is that they would measure points from this place, from this starting from here to like Stoughton and Dedham and other cities and say that's how many miles it is to Boston. But the stone is actually a mortar that was used to make dyes back in the old days. And the legend was that it came from the Mayflower though we can't prove it, but nobody knows why it was there. But this is a very cool thing to see. It is in the oldest box, the, the Scotto's Dock region of Boston, um, which has some very old streets and uh, the Union Oyster House and some old bars. It, it, and uh, I love going there because you can really get a flavor of what Boston was like by taking a look. 
in the Reedville racetrack. I actually went here a few months ago. It's completely gone. Even this sign is gone now. The city of Boston came there and they put this sign there to commemorate what was a really cool racing track that uh, many records were set in. Uh, they did everything there, horses, cars, steam cars, gasoline race cars, motorcycles, everything was raced here. And it was also used as the um, landing touchdown place for that Sturdivant plane that I was telling you about earlier. It closed in 1937 after 50 years of use and completely disappeared. It was taken over by Stop and Shop. And when Stop and Shop moved out, Warner Brothers bought the Stop and Shop um, building and made it into a um, uh, film studio where they shot Boston films. I actually worked on the film Mystic River, but, but not there. Um, now, when you go down there, even the sign is no longer visible. It's really sad. Ooh, sorry, I already showed that one. The Cyclorama in Boston. This is a building that's quite hidden. This is a really hidden thing. This building was uh, on Tremont Street in the South End. And before movies, Cycloramas were big entertainment. And what they did was they painted huge pictures in 360 degrees so that everywhere you turned, you were always looking at something. And the first thing that was displayed was Philippo's, Philip Pato's Battle of Gettysburg painting, which you see up there in the corner. And this was a historically accurate painting that was 380 feet long that went around you in a complete circle. And what they did was they filled the building up with sand and cannons and boxes and statues of dead horses and dead soldiers and trees. And so that when you went in there, you got the real experience of uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is what he's showing here is Pickett's Charge. So um, the painting disappeared for decades, was only found in the 1960s. One piano was actually missing. And it was the only one left, three of them were made. It was the only one left and now it's displayed at Gettysburg. And I actually made a trip to Gettysburg to see this painting. And it's absolutely astounding. So the cyclorama is still there and it's used for various events and conventions. Um, but the fact that this building was there and that this was there and it came from Boston is an incredible experience. So, you know, Boston made the first subway tunnel and there used to be uh, a place called Scully Square, which is now where City Hall is. So when City Hall was built in, Scarlet Square was torn down. So there are still some tunnels under the ground. In fact, there are four stations that are abandoned under City Hall. And uh, they used to open them up once a year on around Halloween. And they would let 30 tourists, they would do a lottery for 30 tourists to go down and look at these abandoned stations. They don't do it anymore. Um, you can only get to them through the uh, City Hall parking garage, which since 9-11 has been strictly closed and guarded. Um, and some of the stations are now filled with ventilation equipment for City Hall. So uh, the history is disappearing, but these tunnels are there under the ground abandoned. I actually wrote a book, um, a novel, a murder novel that was based in part around these tunnels. The Rope Walk in Boston. Boston was actually one of the rope making capitals of the entire world because it was a big seagoing center. And this rope walk is in the Charlestown Navy Yard. A lot of rope making technology was invented here in Boston. And these buildings were long thin buildings because you had to have a building to make uh, rope. And rope making was the very dangerous task because they would burn down the cities because at the end of the rope walk was a big pile of boiling pitch that they would throw the rope in so that it wouldn't rot when it was on the ships. But pitch is essentially turpentine and if it boiled over, it caught on fire and burned down the city. And that did happen to Boston a couple of times. So they passed a law saying that rope walks could only be on the water. So uh, rope walks disappeared. Um, and there are only a few left in all of the United States today. I think another one is in Philadelphia or maybe Baltimore. This one has been made into apartments and condos, although it's a rope walk museum at the very end. I'm going to tell you a terrible story that back in the 1980s when I was a bad man, I broke into this building out of strict curiosity to see what was in there. And they still had all the same machines and everything, just as it had been abandoned. Now in the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan brought back the four battleships, there was only one place that could make new rope for those battleships and that was in this building. So men actually came back here and used these original machines to make the rope for those battleships, which is pretty amazing. 
This is a uh, interesting thing. It's the trophy room, which is underneath the Longfellow Bridge on Storo Drive. And as you're walking from one place to another, no one knows how it got started. Somebody put some shelves in there and started putting trophies on it. And it was done like maybe as an art installation. When they redid the bridge over again, this whole thing disappeared. But then suddenly it reappeared when they were done. And now it's back again. And if you go back there, you can actually see this. And this is a cool part of Hidden Boston. That is the end of my presentation. Woohoo! I went an hour just like I said I would go. I hope you enjoyed it. I love doing this. And if you have any cool questions or if you'd like to say anything or add any things you would like to see uh, that I've forgotten, or if I told lies and made mistakes, please let me know. Thank you very much. Robert, it's good to see you back. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jay. You're a man of your word. Uh, you got us till eight o'clock. Um, we'll take uh, at least a few minutes of questions. So if folks okay. have any comments or questions, uh, please get them into the chat or the Q&A. Uh, Deb says that she loved your talk and she actually went to a wedding at the Gibson Mansion. Uh, Elaine says this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a question from Deb. Uh, this was regarding back when you were talking football briefly. Deb wants to know who pays the dues for the Oneida football team? You know, I've actually looked into that um, once or twice, and I don't know who it is. I haven't been able to find out who it is that pays the dues, but the dues have been paid faithfully every single year. Great. Uh, Christine notes that uh, there's a rope walk at the Mystic Seaport Museum. Yes, there is. I've been to that, that rope walk. Yeah, I've been there. Good. Uh, any other comments or question, folks, before we wrap up for the evening? I know Jay threw a lot of information at us. Uh, Jill says, terrific presentation, very interesting. Uh, Renee says that you described several times when the inventor created a fire engine plus one fleet and all were destroyed. When were they finally accepted? It seems like um, after that thing with Cleveland, they started to just be, they just uh, smothered, they just overcame all of the uh, protests. Firefighting was much different in those days than it is now. Firefighting was a private organization, very fraternal. You actually had to pay a subscription to uh, get firemen to put out your fire. And if you didn't pay, they wouldn't put out your fire. They actually had different fire hydrant connectors and the firemen would come and if they had the wrong hose, they couldn't attach to the fire hydrant to put out the fire. But eventually they did overcome the protests of, against the fire engine. Uh, Pat King points out that there is a Stanley Museum in Kingfield, Maine. Yes, there is. Uh, Stan, I am a big, big fan of Stanley. Um, I have not been to the Kingfield Museum because it is very far away, but I have done a lot of work uh, reading up and investigating Stanley's. The Stanley brothers were incredible. They failed primarily because they were terrible people who didn't like their customers. And the electric starter in 1912 on the Cadillac killed them. Uh, Shinwi says, thank you, great presentation. Robert says, very interesting. Michelle mm -hmm. says, thank you so much, great presentation. What's up? I, th I think with that, Jay, well, Jay, we don't want your head to get too big. Um, so Jay, do you have any last words before we wrap up for the group? Well, um, there's one more section on hidden Boston and then we'll do free, cheap and dear. If, up, if it's up to Robert, if, and when we do these things, but I hope that you'll, you liked it enough that you will come back and, and, and get more punishment. Yeah, guys, please fill out the feedback survey. Let me know what you thought of tonight's event. I certainly intend on bringing Jay back for part three. Uh, don't quite know when yet, but I'll make sure to notify all of you when I do that. Uh, Renee says, thank you so much. Can't wait to visit Boston again. Stephanie says, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, Elaine, all oh, right, Elaine. Elaine can have the last question. She likes to do this. What does the sham mill make? Am I pronouncing that? Oh, the that? Schwamm mill. They, you Schwamm can see that in, this, in this last picture, they make oval picture frames. You can still buy them. They cost them the thousands of dollars. They make all the picture frames for the presidents that are hung in the Capitol. In Washington. All right. And Christine has another last minute question. Is the last building in West End slated to become a tenement museum? Have you heard that? I have not heard that. That is a news to me. Uh, some people still live there. I'll, I'll have to do some research on it, actually. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. 
I uh, hope to see you Thursday. Uh, look for more information about that event in your email tomorrow morning. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thanks again, Jay. Thank you, everybody. And you too, Robert.